Uh, Heretics, we are very, very fortunate today to have uh, a special guest on the show. Uh, Jared Yates Sexton is a professor, a journalist, and the author of several books, including The People Are Going to Rise Like the Waters on Your Shore, A Story of American Rage, and more importantly for our discussion today, American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People, which comes out in September. I've pre-ordered my copy, and I have a feeling that after today's discussion, you will want to as well. Jared Yates Sexton, welcome to the How to Heretic. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, lovely to have you. Um, So, theocracy here in America. (laughs) I came came across a long Twitter thread you did on March 22nd, and I knew we had to talk to you. We talk a lot about theocracy on this show, and after some long thought and consideration, eh, we're against it. Not a good way to run a society, but... Anyone really paying attention to the multiple snowballing crises we are facing uh, as a country right now knows we are hurtling toward a serious grab for some kind of Christian death cult supply side theocracy as we speak. So Sounds terrible when you say it that way. (laughs) It does sound really super shitty. So, Jared, American theocracy, we may be hurtling toward it, but you argue we're already neck deep in it and that it all began with a little thing called the Confederate States of America. Yeah. So um, for for the book uh, that we're talking Mm. about, American Rule, um, I I sort of needed to go back into American history, which, you know, I I, I have a basis in it. I've I've been educated in it. I've looked into it. I've spent my time reading all these history books. I feel like I I, I felt like I had a good understanding of American history. And sure. But I think like a lot of other Americans, um, that faith in my own understanding of history was shattered in November 2016. (laughs) And, you know, like everybody, well, not everybody else. Obviously, there were people who thought that Donald Trump could win. But for those of us who thought there was no possible way that this person could win the presidency. Yeah, um, this absurd clown. Right. This absolute buffoon. There was no way possible (laughs) that he could, you know, win after after everything. And when it happened, it shattered my understanding of my faith in history. And so what I did was I decided to go back and start from the very beginning and um, start to start to really understand like the parts of American history that I didn't have a full understanding of, because there's like all these parts that, Mm. you know, when when you're in school, like they'll mention them, you know, it'll be like the Korean War was then. And then it, yeah. you know you move on, and that's it. And you don't learn. Yeah, about you it. remember some some dates and a couple generals' names, and if you're done. That right? right, you know. And and there's all these parts in the the history books that are like one paragraph long, and you're like, no, I think there's a bigger story here than than I understand. And so I went back to the very beginning, and you know the way it works, I, I've realized that the the founding of the United States was problematic and didn't work the way that we all thought it did or, or were told. So right. I started making my way through American history and I got to um, the Civil War. And, yeah. you know, this was one of those things I've always been kind of fascinated by um, because the Confederate States of America is this point in American history where all of America's ills sort of coalesce, coagulate <laughs> into this disease Right. This like open wound. And none of the history books that I read really talked about the Confederate States of America. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I was talking about this with somebody else the other day. Like most of the books about the Civil War are about, oh, Robert E. Lee looked great in his jacket and he made this amazing military maneuver, you know. Yeah. And and instead and it was all based on like the military gamesmanship and how things worked. But it didn't really get into Confederate culture. And so what I did was I started tracking down everything that I could find written about the Confederate States of America, which actually it's very little because it's not a period we like to talk about because it actually reflects the worst parts of American history and culture. Hmm. And what I found was that the Confederate States didn't secede and form their own country as if they wanted to create a new country. They actually believed that they were the true United States of America and Mm. that the rift between the North and the South was actually a betrayal by the North of the South. And that uh, because they had been betrayed, that they were going to take over what the founders had started. So what you find in all of the Confederate iconography is you find all of the founding fathers, particularly George Washington, tons of statues and parts of him. He's on the seal, all this stuff. But you also find, and this is buried until you start looking in the right places, and it's buried for a specific reason. 
The Confederate States of America was based on Christian theology. It was based mm. on the idea that the Christian God was a racist, white supremacist God who had determined that blacks should be slaves and that whites should be their masters. And that would be the makeup of society. Right. And so it's this incredibly <clears throat> uh, like overt and awful manipulative society in which you have Confederate preachers who are preaching this constant perverted Christian racist theology. And, and it's all right. based on the idea of the entirety of the South was indoctrinated to believe that they were God's chosen people and that they would win the civil war. But when they lost a battle, the preachers and the politicians would declare days of religious humiliation where you wouldn't leave the mm. house and you would just bow down to God and apologize until you won the next battle. And, you know, all of these bizarre Christian cultish behaviors. Right. And so what you actually find is the Confederate States of America, as we didn't know it, was a Christian theocracy in action. And that is um, that is one of the reasons why it ended up being this like racist white supremacist dystopia. Right. And, and uh, you know, we talked a little bit uh, before we're taping it that, that, look, the, they're, they're using the scripture, they're using the Bible uh, as a justification for slavery and the abolitionists using the Bible as justification to fight slavery. They're both right. Right. And, and, you know, as, as again, we talked a little bit about this, I, I think that the real heart of the Amer of American Christianity lies in the Old Testament and not in the Gospels of Jesus. Oh, and that's where all of this uh, takes place, right? And and we're going to yeah. talk a lot before this podcast is over about the division yeah. between the Old and the New Testament and how that is completely, um, you know, screwed up American politics and, and how dangerous it's been. But you're absolutely right. It was a rageful Christianity. And meanwhile, in the North, and, and this is one of those things, um, we talked about this too, um, you know, everybody, like, when they learn about the Civil War, they're told that the North was this like heroic anti-slavery coalition and it was all about freeing the slaves. That's all bullshit. That's not actually true. Um, right. You know, so I and, and again, I, I come from Indiana. I, I, you know, we're one of what, five or six states that fights over the right to call Abraham Lincoln our own. And <laughs> in, in absolute truth, Abraham Lincoln was a white supremacist. And hmm. Abraham Lincoln, in his speeches, including the famous debates and, you know, all of these addresses, he's like, well, you know, I don't necessarily want there to be slavery, but as long as there is a divide between whites and blacks, I want the whites to be supreme. And hmm. there are even these times, and this is the, the craziest thing, where he's trying to sell the slaves to other countries. Uh, he was on the record trying to sell African-American slaves to uh, Great Britain to move them out. This is where like all of them. Yeah, absolutely. To, to offload them to another country. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's where Liberia comes from, right? right. Is, Liberia. He, yeah. he actually sends a group of <laughs> slaves uh, to uh, an island and they start succumbing to starvation and disease and they bring them back just like the surviving few. And so hmm. what we actually, fine and and there's this other moment too where uh you know lincoln tells everybody he's like there there will never be peace in america until you know african americans are gone and so he actually mm -hmm. meets with a coalition of like frederick Douglass and other african american leaders and he's like uh you need to convince your people to leave america and they're like we're sorry but we're american and so this is like the first time that Lincoln's actually pushed on this thing. So what we actually have is this myth of America in which Lincoln was somehow or another, well, not somehow or another, it was actively done, turned into a messiah figure. Right. right. So there's this idea within the Confederacy and within the Civil War, and it's all, you know, religious myth turned into secular myth. Um, right. So just to take listeners through a quick little weird thing, we need to talk about Black Easter 1865. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is weird. And like this, this made me do a double take when I originally found it, because this isn't something that we're taught, because once you start looking at it, you start to realize like the weirdness of it, right? <laughs> so yeah. uh, I believe it was on Palm Sunday is when Lee surrenders to Grant at uh, Appomattox. And yep. that starts off the Holy Week. So then on Good Friday, and this is right after the Civil War has ended. And remember that the Civil War is this apocalyptic battle. It didn't seem like it was ever going to end. And, you know, the, the, the death toll is unbelievable. The carnage yeah, is massive. terrible. It's yeah. just an apocalypse in America. So it ends yeah. on Palm Sunday. And then on Good Friday, Lincoln is shot at uh, Ford's Theater. 
Yeah. So he shot on Good Friday. He dies the Saturday afterwards. And so then the first Easter, which again is all about the solstice and rebirth, right? It's all about yeah. like uh, renewal. renewal and resurrection. America ends the bloody civil war. And Lincoln dies the day after Good Friday. He gets shot on Good Friday and then dies on Saturday. So that Sunday, that Easter Sunday, Black Easter, 1865, suddenly all of, especially the northern preachers, hold their sermons where they are taking Lincoln and Christ and they put them on the exact same level because he is an American martyr. He was sent here, right, right to die right. for our sins. And, you know, there's like all these op-eds, <clears throat> all these essays, all these parts that are talking about Lincoln being the Messiah of America. And you start finding these... Um, well, there's no other way to put it. They're batshit. These batshit pieces <laughs> of art. And 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 again, like I, I want I, I don't like to tell listeners what to do, but pause this thing, go Google mm-hmm. it, spend a couple of minutes and just lose your mind. I don't know if you've seen them. I, I have seen them and they are and I, I they felt I, they were reflexively a little creepy. They're really creepy. Um, <laughs> but I with knowing all this now, going back and putting my eyes on it again, they're going to be super creepy. OK, so everybody, you just or, or, or listen and just go do it. Whatever. We're, we're a multitasking culture. So yeah. what happened? is all of a sudden this popular art starts coming into uh you know popularity that's very redundant but true and so what ends up happening is you start getting all of these pieces of popular art that show george washington in heaven surrounded by choirs of angels welcoming abraham lincoln into heaven and right. you start finding this weird secular bastardization of the christian myth all of a sudden, you have George Washington as the father. You have freedom and liberty as the Holy Spirit. And you have Abraham Lincoln as the son and the martyr and the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, in American history, you start seeing an intertangling of public and secular and, and all these bizarre uh, mutations of a Christian national white myth. And the belief is that Lincoln as a Messiah has forgiven us our sin of white supremacy and slavery. And now America is washed clean and ready to begin its new destiny. Right. And then, <clears throat> pardon me. And then no, it, we're, we're done having to deal with racism. That's all oh, that's it's behind gone. us. Why would you ever it's have a- to deal with racism again? It's just gone. That's right. We were cleansed in the blood of the, you know, of, of Abraham Lincoln and the Republic. And we're all done with that. Yeah. Why would you ever have another problem with racism? So what ends up happening, and, and this is the thing, and for um, your listeners who pr- might not have heard me talk about this before, um, this is the basis of what I've come to call the cult of the Shining City. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I brought that name out and I've, I've gotten a little bit of pushback. People are like, well, there's nobody out there who calls themselves the cult of the Shining City. I'm like, I'm well aware. You know, these are people, um, these are white identity evangelicals. And that is mm-hmm. a specific group of evangelicals. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and anybody who's listening who has uh, been a part of this knows what I'm talking about. It's a group of people who are brought up to believe that they are the chosen people as Americans and as white Americans. And that there is this conspiracy against them and against America. It takes the uh, it takes the form of the New World Order. It, now it's the deep state yeah. or QAnon conspiracies, all this stuff. And what I ended up finding out, and I had no idea because I grew up in this thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I grew up in a very extremist, Baptist, Pentecostal type of um, childhood. and So fortunate. That must have been wonderful. Yeah, I'm not dealing with those problems to this very day still. <laughs> it's all behind me. <laughs> right. And, and so, like, you know, I grew up in this very, again, bad shit situation where, you know, I, I got taught how to do battle with Satan. Like, if he showed up in my living room, I was ready to duke it out with the Prince of Darkness. As a child, right? As a child. And, like, you know, I would have, um, you know, I would have, like, health problems. And, like, they would talk to me about, like, maybe I had a demon inside of me. Right. Maybe maybe the forces of evil. And I remember there's this really bizarre thing. And when I tell people and and you and I were talking about this before we started taping, when you talk to people who don't have this experience, it sounds so insane, you know? Yeah. And I I, like I'll never forget 
I was seven years old and there, um, this was back and we're going to get to Ronald Reagan in a minute. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, satanic panic and, and how this yep. all came about. But I remember play all the hits. Oh yeah. Just hang tight. <laughs> old man's going to come up here in a second. Yeah. And I remember being like seven or eight years old and there was like uh, an NBC special about demonic possession. Mm-hmm. You know, that used to be a thing or, you know, uh, unsolved mysteries at eight, demonic possession at nine. And yeah. I remember I asked my grandmother, I was like, is demonic possession real? And she's like, oh, yeah, it's definitely for real. And I asked her, I said, well, how do demons possess you? And she said, well, they get you while you're asleep. Ugh. You know, and so like for the next, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine months, I tried not to sleep. Right. Yeah, my I had an aunt who did exactly the same thing to me, and it was at, at a at a very tender age, and it was a nightmarish year. Right. Of, exactly. of hallucinating because I was trying not to sleep. Exactly. And so we yeah. would, you know, we we lived in this older house. We were very very poor, and like the house would creak, you know, over the course of the night. And my grandmother would talk about how it was spirits, and you know, like the past, all this nonsense you know yeah that, that is just in indoctr- child abuse it's child abuse that's exactly yeah. right and Absolutely. so we we i grew up in this this was um unfortunately i didn't realize it was a cultish environment you know i lived yeah. in a small town um i write about this often i i grew up in this small town that is um notorious for having one of the largest like fourth of july celebrations like in in the midwest um, you know, is very the paper. real the real America, is real what capital R, capital A, real America, and yeah. you know, grew up in this town where, you know, we were fed a steady diet of of white identity nationalism, you know, mm-hmm. mixed in with this, um, you know, Christian occultism, and I had no idea that my preacher and other preachers and other community leaders were pushing this old Confederate theology. Um, right. I just thought it was Christianity, right? You just that well, you just it was normal to you. Yeah, you were just... when you're in a cult, you don't always know you're in a cult. You know, like yeah. fi- finding out you're in a cult is one of the first moments where you're like, maybe I should get out of this fucking cult. And that's not what you know when you grew up in it. You know, it's no. it's Plato's cave. Like you're in the cave, right. you don't know there's a life outside of it. And, yeah, and you trust you, – you know, as a child, of course, you have to trust your elders and, and what they say is how things are. They're doing their due diligence. Why wouldn't they? Well, especially in a cult. Your yeah. elders are unquestionable. And, yeah. you know, there, I assume there are people listening who can relate to this. You know, cults – A lot. <laughs> yeah, right. Cults tell their, their, um, their devotees, they're like, you cannot listen to anyone outside of this cult. Right? Right. You can't – and by the way, this is all Christian uh, culture war shit. It's like yeah. you can't listen to these <laughs> records. You can't watch these movies. If your friend's not in the church, they can't be your friend anymore. And so what they do is they continually continually insulate you until you don't understand that there's a world outside of it. Exactly. Now, yeah. I, I didn't realize that I was in a cult until Donald Trump really became uh, prevalent. And, hmm. you know, and, and the church and the people that I knew, I'd always known there was deep, deep hypocrisy in the church. And sure. I, I left the church at an early age. I was one of those people who at like, you know, 13 or 14, I was like, there's something wrong here. And, <laughs> and I don't trust this. And, you know, obviously I was alone in that, couldn't talk to anybody. And then, you know, I was... We, we've had very parallel lives, Jared. <laughs> thank you. I, you know, I think there's a path that a lot of us have found, right? Yep. And yep. so, you you know, you start reading the books that people don't know that you're reading and you start listening to the music they don't know you're listening. And the next thing you know, by the time you're 16 or 17, you are just like an aggressive atheist or, you know. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, I, I left it when I was in my teens, but my understanding of it didn't really come into full fruition until this happened. And and like a lot of people, I watched as the evangelical church uh, rallied around Trump. Mm-hmm. And when people started saying like, man, it really seems like the church is hypocritical when it comes to Trump. I was like, well, of course they're hypocritical. They're, they're hypocrites. And mm. I had want, you know, I would... Man, this is I never thought I was gonna be talking about this on a podcast. You know, <laughs> it was like one of those things where like I wanted to be a preacher when I was a little kid. Huh. And one of the things that made me decide not to was the preacher we had one of those charismatics, right? Right. He was incredibly 
charismatic and and just he, he was a rock star is what he was right. and you know he'd get up there and he would sweat and scream about you know fire and brimstone and sins and eternal damnation and in a way you know that's almost like the stones playing their greatest hits right and he ended up having an affair with the head deacon's wife and oh and that, wow that's a shocker right and you know it was like one of those things where it was like well the pastor has his problems and all of a sudden it's like, oh, and then you start hearing the conversations that are all based on like classism and racism and misogyny. Mm -hmm. And when you really start putting those things together, you realize that their support of Donald Trump is not that surprising at all. Hey, all there is so much crazy info in this interview. I didn't want to cut Jared off. So we kept going and we're going to cut it in half. Part two of this interview will air on ne next week's show. Until then, if you want to find Jared, he does long and fascinating Twitter threads about a, lo a lot of the subjects we discussed today at J.Y. Sexton, S-E-X-T-O-N. Uh, he has his own excellent podcast called The Muckrake, which I highly recommend. And uh, he, bl he blogs at themuckrake.com. If you would like to pre-order his book, it's called American Rule. How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. Tune in again next week for the rest of the interview.